Okay. Good. How about you? Already, just about ready to get underway. Uh, left to right, Coach Chris Mack, JP McCura, Malcolm Bernard, Trayvon Blewett, Quentin Gooden, and Tyreek Jones. Uh, we'll have uh, Coach give us an opening statement, and then we'll just open it up to questions for anybody up here. Coach? Yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, we're, we're thrilled to be in the position that we are. Um, but as I said last night, I feel like we've earned our way to this position. We recognize we have a, um, a tremendous team ahead of us uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, you know they've been they've been terrific all year. They've got some uh, players with very uh, various skills and talents, and uh, we're gonna have to bring our best uh, tomorrow night to win. But that's what we aim to do. All right, we have uh, just put your hands up for questions. We'll go in the front. Just give your name and affiliation on the first go. Hey guys, Pat Brennan, Cincinnati Enquirer. Uh, Chris, this is for you. Um, it seems like the bigs have faced a pretty uh, unique challenges at each phase of the tournament here. What kind of a challenge is uh, facing this 7-1, 300-pounder? Um, the biggest. I mean, Karnowski, is, uh, he's a load. Um, I think Xavier fans will uh, you know, harken back to, to Matt Stainbrook. The similarities are, are they're eerie. I mean, he's three or four inches taller than Matt. Um, no disrespect to Matt, he's in better shape. And uh, he has a, uh, a great touch, a unique ability to pass from, from his position. Uh, he affects shots defensively at the rim. And Gonzaga does a really good job of keeping him in the lane defensively. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they have the best defense in the country um, by their numbers. So uh, he, he's, a, he's a big challenge. I love our post players. They've played their tails off here during tournament play, and they're going to need to do that tomorrow in order for us to advance. Oh, in the back left, standing. Uh, Jacob Thorpe, Spokesman Review. Chris, uh, a lot of your opponents in the tournament have talked about the, the difficulty or how they struggled with your team's ability to shift defenses on the fly. Uh, what's the key to making that work, and, and is that an area in which your team has improved over the last month or so? Uh, it's definitely an area that, that our team's improved. Uh, I probably didn't give them a chance to, to improve in it early in the year because we didn't play multiple defenses. But uh, I think we, we recognized as a, as a program that in order to uh, give our guys the best chance to compete, uh, that was what we had to do. Um, for us, it, it doesn't really come down to, to what our opponent uh, is necessarily trying to do. We have to be able to communicate because uh, different teams are going to attack it differently. And with the short turnaround that we have, being able to recognize how Gonzaga wants to attack our zone, uh, our zones, I should say, uh, and, and how they want to attack our man defense is, is paramount. When we understand that, then it's all about being able to communicate uh, and understand where shooters are, um, where our positioning needs to be, and then, and then playing with our hair on fire, you know, playing harder. Um, and I think we did that in the second half. And then anytime you play zone, you have to figure out a way to rebound the ball. We didn't do it in the first half of um, yesterday's game. We did it in the second half, and, and ultimately that was the reason we were able to pull away. Left side, fourth row. Ron Karczyk from the San Francisco Chronicle. For any of the big guys, um, maybe kind of echoing the question to, for, to Chris earlier about Karnowski on what kind of challenge he presents and, and how much, not just being 7-1, but being 300 pounds and as, as uh, wide and mobile as he is, how difficult that, that makes that challenge. I just think we have to come out, be tough, and uh, just contain him, and make everything that everything that he gets tough, and he has to work harder for it than we do, and um, that's just basically it. Standing back left. Just to follow up on that earlier question, what was the impetus to become more multiple with your defenses? Um, necessity, and the fact that we weren't playing, you know, 10, 11 guys. Wanted to keep them fresher. Um, we had guys playing heavy minutes. Uh, you know, for instance, Quentin went from playing 14, 15 minutes a game to playing 35 minutes a game. Uh, and uh, 
And, and quite honestly, we weren't very, very good at man. And uh, I'm not going to keep doing something if, it, if it's not effective. And, um, you know, I think uh, our players, t it took a while for us to be uh, confident in it, to understand all the different slides and, and, and things that we had to do. But uh, I think, again, we're, we're far from perfect, but our effort's been good and our understanding's much better. On the left, third row. Jeff Ferrato, the Mercury News. Uh, for Chris and maybe for one of the players, if you could address this. I'm sure all the Cincinnati people are tired of it, but could you tell us the story about burning the calendars and carrying the ashes around, sort of when that happened, Chris, why you thought of it, how you thought of it, and sort of symbolically what it's meant to you guys? Yeah, I, I mean, I know that story is getting a lot of publicity, and um, but I, I want to make sure that you know everybody understands that the character of our guys and their ability to fight through adversity and still believe in our coaching staff and, and each other uh, is paramount. You know, it, um, it started with, you know, after our, our fifth straight loss in a row, which, by the way, was a brutal stretch. We had Villanova, three road games against NCAA tournament teams, followed by Butler at home. Um, we were missing, you know, Trayvon for three of those games, Edmund for all of them. And, um, you know, even though that we had lost five in a row, I wanted our guys to understand two things. The magnitude of the schedule we had just played, and secondly, that we were still an at-large team by every bracketologist known to man. We were still an 8-9 seed, so as low as we felt, we were still a tournament team. They had to believe that and understand there was a lot to play for moving forward. So uh, we had a calendar printed up with the game dates and the scores and the results, and I asked each of the guys to write down you know, one thing without revealing it to their teammates that they were willing to sacrifice um, you know, for, the, for the remainder of the season for the betterment of the team. And uh, whether they believed it or not, uh, they did it. They, we lit the calendars on fire in a big aluminum trash can. It takes a while for things to burn. I didn't, I didn't realize that. The meeting went about a half hour longer than expected. And uh, then we took the ashes, and I asked Alan Payne to go to Walmart and buy an urn. He got there, and the only one was like pink with green flowers on it, so we didn't think that was appropriate. So he bought a jar and, that you could see through, and we just called it an urn. And uh, we've kept the ashes in there ever since. And the symbolism is to not worry about what's happened behind us, but to focus on moving forward, uh, control what we can. And uh, we've tried to keep that urn either at the scores table during practice when our players walk in the locker room, on the locker room floor. Uh, and our manager's done a terrific job taking it everywhere we've gone. I mean, like Coach Mack said, it, it represents the, the month of February. And we went through a a tough six game stretch. And as players, when we look at that jar, we just, we just know to move forward and that the pass is done with and we're gonna look forward to playing more games. Second row middle. Uh, Jim Wazarski, Cincinnati Inquirer. I guess, I'll, Chris, I'll start with you, but if JP, Malcolm, or Trayvon could jump into this with, with Quentin. Um, and and have, as you mentioned, that, that, that role he had to then play and grow into sort of unexpectedly at the time. Um, what was maybe the challenge there? As, as a coach when that happens so suddenly, and then I guess for, for you uh, upper class backcourt mates, how, is, how have you seen him grow since then? Yeah, I, to start off, I, I would say that from day one, Quentin's been a terrific defender, and that, that gave him a chance. You know, he, he wasn't the guy that was getting blitzed off the bounce, forgetting assignments. Uh, he took great pride in his defense. Um, you know, where I think Quentin struggled at times was his decision making and his confidence like most freshmen. And um, I think once he, he sort of got his sea legs under him, um, was able to play through mistakes, you know, he didn't have that luxury early on because when he, when he made a few mistakes in a row, it was easy to pull him to the side, put him on the bench, and, and let an all-conference player go in. And, um, you know, sometimes that's what you need when you're young. You need an opportunity to uh, make a few mistakes and continue to play through them. And I, I think his teammates have gained a great confidence in Quentin throughout the, these last couple months. I know I have. Um, he's wide-eyed. He's never at one point ever felt like or showed like he had answers or he was giving excuses as to why he couldn't do something or didn't do something. And, and that's a trait of a great player and, and a humble kid. Um, and I'm happy for him because uh, put a lot of time in, in the film room. Uh, you know, I've been on him. Hell, I was on him last night. You know, because he still still didn't know what he was doing in the zone, but um, 
he's done a great job. I'm happy for him. Uh, I would have to say the same as coach. I mean, um, Quinn being a freshman, I mean, he had to step into that role and become our point guard and our leader on the floor. And I think he's done a tremendous job. Um, he's found his way. And uh, he's, he's definitely been helping us a lot. And we've been helping him, too. Um, and I think that works, works both ways. Obviously, you have to listen to the coaching staff, but you have to listen to the guys that are around you on the floor. Um, and we, we try to do our best in helping him uh, go get through this process just as much as he does his best of getting through it on his own. For the back standing. Uh, Jim Meehan at the Spokesman Review. For Chris, uh, you're able to outscore Arizona in the paint. You're not the tallest team, but what does that speak to of, of what you're able to do offensively and the guy's individual ability? Well, I think it, it shows that our players understand what our purpose is on offense. Uh, regardless of the opponent, you know, it's my belief, and I, and I hope it trickles down to our players, that good teams find a way to get the ball into the lane. And, and they probably get sick of hearing me say this, but uh, you have to get the ball into what we call the box or the lane or the paint uh, through a few ways, and that is through post-ups, through drives, through offensive rebounds, and through set plays. And um, our teams really recognize that. The team that can put another team in foul trouble or get in there usually uh, generates open looks either from the perimeter or underneath. You're going to draw second and third defenders, whereas if the ball stays on the perimeter, there's no need to bring a second defender. And, and that's been uh, an emphasis for a long time at Xavier and will continue to be. And uh, these guys are, are, are making it happen uh, through their hard work and their intelligence. Questions? Go back to Jeff on the left. Yeah, Quentin, can you just talk about your development and maybe what's been the toughest thing you've had to to learn on the fly here as you've uh, been thrust into this new role? Um, I feel like, you know, the toughest thing I had to deal with was, you know, playing through my mistakes. You know, I, I expect so much out of myself that, you know, when I make a mistake, I kind of get down. But, you know, I give credit to these guys and uh, just, you know, build, putting confidence in me, you know, tell me I have to keep playing, and, you know, uh, that everybody makes mistakes. I'm just out to play through it. And, uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to these guys for leading me because they never led me into the wrong direction. Anybody else? We'll go on the right, a few rows back. Uh, Tim Pondis from the Washington Post. You, you mentioned last night, Chris, that uh, I think something was brought up about Gonzaga and you kind of dismissed the, the question about just being too Jesuit schools. But that being said, in a, in a sport where you look around and you see so many of these teams from the Power Five conferences with these football programs have been able to advance deep in the tournament. Is there any sense of pride to have, you know, your school going up against Gonzaga to the premier, um, you know, schools in the country in terms of basketball without having that extra support involved in it? Absolutely. You know, I've, I've known Coach Few for a long time, and, um, you know, I think Gonzaga does things the, the way that we do it. Um, I can't speak for everything they do, but, you know, at Xavier, uh, homecoming is around a basketball game. You know, parents' weekend is around our midnight madness. Um, everything is so basketball-driven. We, we play uh, Villanova. We play Cincinnati. Like, our students are going to camp out for tickets. And I don't know if that always happens at a place that uh, has a 100,000-seat football stadium. And so we, um, uh, we cherish that. And it's a credit to Gonzaga. It's a credit to the guys up here and the guys in the locker room and the ones before them at Xavier, that both of these programs are, are in the position that we're in. And, uh, you know, I, I got off the elevator today and, um, you know, was, was coming to the bus to, to come over to the arena, and, and I saw this monkey running around, and I picked him up. And so if anybody sees Coach Few later on, if they want to return that monkey, it's in our locker room for him. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> that was that that was that was some funny stuff that he had the other day. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Okay, we'll dismiss the uh, coach. You're going to stay here. Okay. And we're going to send the student athletes to the breakout rooms in the back. Thank and the uh, floor is open to uh, Coach Mack for additional questions.
Go right in the front here, third row back. Hey, Coach, uh, Eamon Brennan from ESPN.com. Can you talk a little about Sean Amara's evolution as a player over the course of the season? He obviously started off getting a decent number of minutes, kind of went away at stretches throughout the season and, and has played more. What, what did you see from him coming down the stretch of the season that led you to give him these opportunities? And then if you could talk about his play. There. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, I'm happy for Sean Amara. You know, I think some of the the best developmental stories uh, of players are the ones that don't get it handed to them early. You know, I think a year ago about the kid James Farr we had who um, struggled to get off the bench his first couple years and turned into an all-conference rebounder his senior year and led us to a two seed. And, and Sean's following that same path. You know, the thing about Sean is he's always been, ever since he came here as a freshman, a terrific back-to-the-basket player, a guy that just really knew how to use his shoulder, uh, had a great touch, um, and, and our guys really have confidence in him and have always had confidence in him as a scorer. Where he's grown is he's become a lot better rebounder. Uh, he's become a more disciplined defender. And I think with anything in sports, it's all about confidence. And I think Sean you know, had some in the beginning of the year, lost it, didn't play as well. And uh, we have three bigs that uh, are all capable. They're all different. And uh, I give credit to Sean for being able to pull himself out uh, of that rut and, and play his best basketball in the last month of the season. And we would not be in the position that we're in, you know, playing for a Final Four if it weren't for Sean. And so uh, I'm proud of him, happy, uh, happy for him, uh, because guys that can go through some adversity and, and aren't handed some things Usually, the, those are the, those are success stories that you root for. Go up front, Chris. Some of the big names in uh, the program's history have been reaching out to this team. I guess starting with Lionel, maybe in Orlando last week. Have you found that? Um, have you found any one of those conversations uh, to be particularly impactful, or do they all just kind of in the in the aggregate? Help. Well, a lot of them are one-on-ones. Are -on They're not necessarily uh, speaking to the team. Now, Lionel was a little bit different. Um, you know, his message, uh, you know, was to the team as a whole. And, um, you know, I just thought it was uh, appropriate for a guy that in his senior year at one point was 10-9. and nine. The team was not in the Big East Conference, really had no chance of making the NCAA tournament as that large uh, until they went on a stretch of winning 15 or 16 of their last 17 games began with a shot against UC, um, and then um, you know, culminated in the Elite Eight run. And I, I wanted him to talk to our team about um, the adversity his team faced and what his team did to sort of flip the script and, and start playing their best basketball of the year down the stretch. I thought he did a terrific job. And then you know, guys like Jordan Crawford and David West, and, uh, Aaron Williams, guys have been, you know, NBA players from our program have reached out. Dave was here at the game last night. And a lot of times, those guys just pull our players aside one-on-one -on -one because there's a brotherhood and a bond um, that Xavier basketball players have um, that's really, really strong. And so if they have words of wisdom, uh, our players are always open ears. Run the left, fifth row. Coach uh, Jay Alter with the Big East Digital Network, when you were rallying off that brutal schedule that you had in February, it made me think, how does the Big East schedule prepare you for a tournament like this? Well, if you can win enough games, it allows you to get in. Um, and you know, the, the strength of schedule that we face, not only the non-conference, but certainly our conference, uh, allowed us to be in the position to, to get in at large with uh, a lot of losses. And, um, you know, the different styles that you play against, uh, the well-coached teams and the talent and the physicality that you play against, I think prepares you well. Now, what, what you don't necessarily get prepared for is that finality of um, you lose and you're done. It's over. And as high as you could be four minutes before the game's over uh, and excited, it's, it can be taken an instant. Our players recognize that from, from our loss last year against Wisconsin, and hopefully uh, – that feeling stays away from us this year. Stay right there, Dan. Chris, hey, Dan Walken, USA Today. Curious why, when you started your career, did you take a job coaching girls basketball? And as you are in that world for a few years, sort of what did you see as your path at that point in your career? 
Uh, well, number one, I, I took the job. I had come back from, from overseas where my uh, career uh, was cut short with injuries. And I didn't, I didn't have a job. You know, I um, became a uh, assistant manager at a video store <laughs> and uh, had, a free, had free time. My sister was playing varsity basketball. Uh, the varsity coach was now moonlighting as the JV coach, too, because the JV coach just took a full-time job and didn't have the time to, to, to coach and found out that my sister, you know, uh, her, her brother had just come back from overseas. And coach said, hey, would you want to coach? And I was like, girls, basketball? I mean, really? But uh, it, was, it was awesome. You know, the first year, I think we were like 17 and 4. Uh, I thought I was John Wooden. I was a JV coach. And it was like you couldn't mess with my set plays. And then the very next year at the same school, we were 4 and 17 because they moved all five kids up to varsity that were sophomores. And so that was a lesson in humility. And um, to be honest with you, I, I coached girls basketball because it was a job that, that I earned and I got. And it's basketball. And I was in charge of my own team. I wasn't an assistant coach. And then I became a varsity coach and would take my varsity team over to Skip's practices for four years. And eventually, you know, he hired me as a director of operations. But, you know, I learned a whole lot, you know, as a varsity coach. There's so many good coaches around the country. Uh, elementary school, high school, girls, guys, boys, girls, doesn't matter. Um, but a lot of them don't get their shot, and I'm forever grateful to Skip Prosser for him allowing me uh, to coach on his staff. Left against the curtain, Josh. Josh Peter, USA Today. How is it you ended up hiring Luke Burry, and what has he brought to the staff? Um, Luke has been a Xavier fan for a long time. I, f I first got to know Luke through our recruitment of Two Holloway uh, when Sean was the head coach. A um, guy by the name of Emmanuel Book Richardson, who's on his staff, was very close to Luke, and Grew up in the same AAU program, if you will. And um, that's how I got to know Luke. And as I've grown into the job here, um, he spread his wings and became an assistant coach. Um, you know, he's been at Wagner, he's been at Towson, he's been at Fairfield, um, or he went to Fairfield, and he's certainly been at uh, Rhode Island with Danny Hurley. And um, very impressed with his ability to recruit and his ability uh, to connect with players. And I think he's really grown into being uh, a terrific assistant coach with, coach with X's and O's. Um, not to mention, I love the movie Caddyshack. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. It's a hell of a movie if you haven't seen it. Stay right in that area, back left standing. Coach Matt Cameron Cox, uh, 12 News out of Phoenix. What does Sister Fleming mean to this team? And it seems like everybody has a story, a uh, favorite story to share with her. Yeah, S Sister Fleming is, um, I mean, she's been with the program well before I was a student athlete at Xavier. And the amount of uh, not just basketball players, but student athletes across the board at Xavier that she's helped um, in, in so many ways, you know, whether it was figuring out a career choice, uh, whether it was making sure they didn't fail a class, uh, making sure that, um, you know, they understood that, that books came before basketball. But make no mistake, sister plays to win. She wants to win. And she, she has been um, the primary reason outside of our players' motivation when they first get to Xavier for the graduation streak of over 100 straight basketball players from our program. That dates back to 1985. Since 1985, there's never been a player that's finished his eligibility at Xavier and doesn't hold their degree. And again, Players and their families are very responsible for that because that's one of the reasons they chose Xavier. But Sister's been very instrumental in that as well. Front row. Chris, based on NCAA tournament results, um, the results would seem to be in line with like preseason rankings for you guys. Now, you've obviously said that outside expectations are not something that you really concern yourself with. What was your expectation for this group at the outset? And have they met that? Well, we set goals, and uh, I'm going to continue to keep those sort of goals in-house. But, you know, my expectations are uh, to continue to improve and, and get better every single day. And I, I know that's uh, really cliche, but, um, you know, we, we set some lofty goals. And if you fall short of them, um, that's okay. You know, but not improving, uh, not coming to practice with a great attitude and great effort uh, isn't okay. Um, so, 
in terms of whether we've exceeded or matched or uh, underachieved to other people's expectations, we really don't concern ourselves with that. Uh, I am proud of this group because when you set off uh, to start a season, you never know what pitfalls or roadblocks you're going to come across. And uh, there's always going to be some type of adversity through the year. How your team handles it um, usually um, reveals the type of team that you have. And uh, our team handled it extremely well. And for that, I'm really proud of our team. Left side, third row, John. John Wellner with the Mercury News. Not that Xavier, Big East, Gonzaga are mid-major in any way, but it does seem like the makeup of the at-large field in recent years has skewed towards the Power Five football leagues. Do you think the presence of one of the two of you will help maybe reverse that trend? Um, I don't know. It's an awkward question because, you know, I know there's five major conferences with football, but, you know, we, we feel like being in the Big East, when you get seven teams out of your ten uh, in the NCAA tournament in your, your regular season and league champion a year ago won the national championship, um, I, it just feels like a, an awkward question. Um, I know everybody wants to label you and box you in, but um, you know, with these two programs, the success they had, I mean, the amount of money and the resources um, that Xavier and Gonzaga put up compared to some of the middling teams in the Power Five, uh, it's, it's, it's apples and oranges. And uh, that is a big reason why both programs have been able to sustain a whole lot of success recently. Front row. Chris, you mentioned uh, some kind of relationship with Mark. If you don't mind me asking, could you expound on the extent of that relationship? And, like, do you ever run into him on the recruiting trail, go head-to-head -head for guys? Yeah, like I mean, we, 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 we don't butt heads on the recruiting trail. Every once in a while with a transfer, and, and we're 0 for 2, by the way. Um, but I've gotten to know him you know, on the road recruiting, not that we're looking at the same players, but all these kids are national kids, and they play in the same tournaments. And then, uh, you know, Nike has a trip for head coaches uh, once a year, and I've gotten to know him. He loves to fish, and, and I love to fish too. Uh, I'm just in Cincinnati at the Ohio River, and he's fishing for, um, you know, trout in his backyard. So it's a little different. I go carp fishing. Um, but I love to fish, and uh, I love to hear his stories. And, and Mark, to me, is, is a guy that uh, knows who he is, He's a family guy. He's as down to earth as it gets, and, and I can connect, and, and um, I like guys like that. Not tomorrow, but I like guys like that. Anybody else? Dan, you got it. Chris, uh, Dan Walken again from USA Today. Uh, the fact that you're in the Big East and the fact that you talk about the resources, I mean, is Xavier the kind of place where a coach, a successful coach, can spend their entire career? They don't fire you. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you want me to expand on it, I'll say, yeah. Um, it might not have been that way um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but I, I think when, when you look around and you see the success that we've had versus other programs, I think when you look at uh, the league that we're in, you know, the stats I rattled off before, um, and understand that a couple of those guys that left Xavier to go to different jobs, spent a large part of their professional and personal life in Cincinnati and with Xavier close to their heart. So uh, I don't think there's any coach in the NBA, in college, in high school that can say, hey, I'm here forever. Um, but when you have uh, what we have at Xavier, um, it's special, and I don't take that for granted. Any follow-ups? Nope. We'll close it off there. Thanks, Coach. Yep, thank you.